Hi, everybody. Good afternoon, and thank you so much for taking the time out of your day today to tune in to our masterclass on inducting and onboarding autistic talent. This is the second masterclass of a series that we will be delivering over the coming months as part of our partnership with irishjobs.ie. At the launch event of our partnership on the 1st of April, we revealed in our collaborative report, Autism in the Workplace, uh, that almost four in five autistic people face barriers to employment in Ireland. While it's currently estimated that one in 65 people in Ireland are autistic, we are still seeing that 85% of autistic people are unemployed or underemployed. So this is the reason why As I Am and Irish Jobs came together to champion autistic talent in the workplace. This journey has seen the rollout of our new series of monthly employer masterclasses like today, covering a range of topics related to recruiting and hiring autistic people. Employers can register for each masterclass with As I Am on asiam.ie. We have two amazing speakers today to share their expertise and their experience with us, and we're very grateful for their participation today. Those speakers are Carly Jones and Coleman O'Connell. We will also have time for questions and answers after hearing from both of our speakers. So if you have any questions throughout the webinar, please just type them into the Q&A box and they'll be addressed at the end. The first speaker that we will now hear from is Carly Jones. Carly is a British autistic advocate, presenter, author, actress, public speaker and safeguarding campaigner who has worked for the inclusion of autistic women and girls since 2008. She was diagnosed autistic as an adult, starting her autism journey after discovering that both her daughters were autistic. As part of her advocacy, she serves on a wide range of boards and committees, including co-chair executive of the NHS Oliver McGowan Mandatory Training Programme, the UK National Autistic Society, the UK Public Appointment Service, the Home Office, and the NHS Immunisations Committee, among many, many others. Always willing and seeking to support and uplift the most marginalised and underserved people within the autistic community, Carly was awarded an MBE in 2017 for her work in advocating for the safety and well-being of autistic women and girls and autistic people with intellectual disabilities. So Carly, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. We always love working with you and we're really excited uh, for everybody else to be able to hear from you today. So I'll hand over to you now if that's okay. Thank you so much, Fiona. I'm a bit worried I'm gonna let you down now. That sounds quite good, doesn't it? And I'm just sat here at home with a very naughty assistance dog next to me and some cheese. So I'm um, hoping, hoping I won't let you down today. I'm very good at going over time as well when it comes to PowerPoints, because I do tend to ramble a bit so I'll try to keep to time today and thank you for having me and um, and hello everyone so um so yes I'm hoping to speak a little bit more about employment which sounds a bit strange really because actually I'm self-employed still a form of employment but I've always found it easier to um remain kind of independent it, it helps with being able to connect dots and ideas and, and make more kind of national level changes um with lots of there's a there's a phrase and i don't know whether it's a, the right one but lots of fingers in pies um trying to trying to spread some um some autistic um equality and, and voices at many different tables can i get the next slide please so yeah current current things I'm doing now um so yeah I'm sitting on a board for Heathrow which is um which is very exciting that board is um I'm the autistic one but it's it's kind of um pan disability so people with many different types of dis disabilities and what's exciting about that is that when you um aren't working just with other autistic colleagues you start to realize that actually many other disabilities have have different um different and very similar challenges to us as well so that's exciting um yeah author i've got a book coming out in december safeguarding autistic girls safeguarding something i'm, I'm very very passionate about um and and some other bits there such as stomp east midlands railway um and and yeah i do a bit of acting as well if you know if, if you're autistic and you can mask there's there's a job in acting for you um uh, particularly if you're quite good at remembering your lines um and, and if you're into acting you could always be a spy couldn't you if you're good at masking next slide please fiona 
so yeah, current statistics and, and hurdles. So the most recent one that we've, we've had over here is the um, Office of National Statistics, who reported that 22% of autistic people were in work. So that wasn't just, um, you know, employed, that was also to do self-employed, and it was looking at um, full-time work and part-time work. So all of the umbrella of different types of work, only 22% of autistic people are, are currently in work. Um, which is um, very sad, actually. Um, I think it's sad not only for, for us autistic lots, um, because, you know, we all want to, to be able to earn a living. And, and, they, and they said, you know, that it wasn't because autistic people didn't want to work, and we do, um, particularly if it's around our, our expertise and our special interests. That's something very exciting as well. But it's also sad for the, uh, for the countries and, and the organisations that, that go without that autistic talent because we have um, very, I'll come on to it in another slide, but we've got a lot to give. Um, there needs to be better help, I think, to, to get more autistic people into work, particularly um, if autistic people are in receipt of benefits, where do they start if they're not allowed to earn kind of more than 20 pounds in one week? How, how do they start? It might be through volunteering, um, but also we have a challenge there because it's not ethical to have um, to have a non autistic person earning three or four times more than um, than than an autistic person simply because they're transitioning from from perhaps the cap of the benefit cap really um, so it's important challenges as a, a self employed autistic person um, I found is two things. One is making sure that actually people are willing to pay. <laughs> um, sometimes if you're autistic and you're incredibly passionate about, you know, the, the career path that you want to go into and that, that subject, um, not always, but sometimes people can assume it's a hobby um, and it's, it's something you like to do for a bit of fun, not actually that it's keeping a roof over your head or feeding your family. So those kind of misconceptions can be really tricky, I think still for autistic adults, um, particularly when they first start going into employment or self-employment um, and being paid timely as well is, is another, another issue. Um, it's, uh, I, I can remember being asked to do, and I won't mention the company because that wouldn't be fair and they're doing great things now, but I can remember it wasn't even at the start of, of being a self-employed uh, consultant stroke advocate. I can remember being asked to go and do a talk in Manchester now, I live about three or four hours on the train away from Manchester. And um, I thought, well, I'm not going to be able to work the day before because I'm going to be, um, you know, I'm going to have to really make sure that I've uh, got all my energy and, uh, and I'm able to do this and prepare. And I'm not going to be able to work the day after because I'm going to be really tired from all that traveling. And obviously, I can't book any, any work that day. So that's kind of three days out of that, that week's diary. Um, and, uh, and I said, oh, yes, I, I'd love to come and do your keynote. What's the fee? Um, now, the, the irony is that they said, actually, there is no fee. We expect you to do this voluntary. And I still do a percentage of voluntary work. So um, that wasn't so, I mean, it, it did jar me a bit, but I thought, OK, um, as long as I'm not out of pocket, it's a really important topic. The irony was it was about valuing autistic talent and valuing autistic um, people in employment, but they weren't willing to actually pay me. But I thought, well, you know, if I'm not out of pocket, um, you know, the train fare is going to be in the hundreds of pounds. If the train fare is covered, it's a really important topic, I'll do it. Um, and they weren't willing to even pay for the train fare. So I did say no, and I know now they're doing great things. Um, and, and I've kind of, I guess, maybe learned from that, that it isn't a hobby. Um, but it, yeah, it felt quite ironic to be invited to talk about how this particular company was really valuing autistic uh, work and autistic talent, yet weren't willing to actually pay an autistic person and were quite happy to let them be hundreds of pounds out of pocket to make them look good. So that happens sometimes, luckily not as much now, but it's something that we need to keep our eyes and ears out for, um, particularly if we are an autistic professional. Um, so yeah, help for parity of pay for autistic people and autistic people with learning disabilities. There have been times where, you know, you might be on a panel and you know the person next to you is getting a £20 Amazon voucher. And that's that's not cool, really. So um, trying to work as hard as I can to make sure that, you know, if I'm on a panel or a board and there's somebody that um, that has a learning disability as well as being autistic, just asking the blunt question, you know, are they getting paid to 
And if so, what? And just having to be a bit blunt about that because um, things need to change and we're not going to get um, more autistic people into work um, and in, in a really meaningful way if, if we're not kind of standing up for one another actually we need to a bit like in acting where you get the male superstars who refuse to get paid double their female um you know female actress uh, i think a lot of us autistic people need to make sure we're looking out for um, autistic people learning disabilities as well because it's rife unfortunately next slides please so yeah every workplace needs autistic people we need to work and we also need, uh, you know, the companies, every workplace needs us. What's been quite lovely, actually, if I think about kind of 13 years ago um, in, in autism advocacy, it would kind of be um, a company would call you up for training or to do a talk because they've got a 14 year old who's autistic doing work experience in that office for a week. And actually, more excitingly now, it tends to be. Um, the CEO of a business or a company who's autistic and it's just like my staff don't understand me they think I'm rude or they think I'm abrupt or they think you know and um, or I'll be a bit of a stickler for time rules and things like that so um, so actually that's that's quite nice because it's shown there's more autism awareness out there but also I think that's great for everyone else in the office to, uh, to, to be aware that they've got you know an autistic director or a CEO or a line manager um, that's that's always a, a great thing, I think. So um, yeah, we're very loyal. Once we're uh, dedicated to to a company, a brand, a task, a project, we uh, we can um, be quite blinkered about that and really want to help. And uh, you know, if you've got a loyal employee, you're going to have uh, less money spent out on that recruitment, on that retention. So it's not just about onboarding autistic talent, it's also about retaining that talent. Um, incredibly hardworking people, um, precise, like precision, often very good at timekeeping. Um, I, I tend to be early for everything, which has been quite difficult in the world we're now, where we're on the old computer screen, because I'll be sat there like half an hour beforehand thinking, do I press the button yet? Um, I still haven't quite learned not to be early for everything. Um, incredibly honest. Now, um, some people don't like it when people are honest. Um, but actually, that's what you need in a workplace. You need that objectivity. You need somebody that's not just going to say yes because they want to impress their manager or they want to impress a senior in their work or, or there's a, an agenda to get a pay rise or something. We, we very, if we know a project is going to be a waste of time and it's going to be a waste of resources and money, we're far more likely to put our hands up and go, you know, this, this isn't going to work. And that takes a lot of bravery. It takes a lot of honesty. And, and you certainly get that. In, um, in, in autistic people. So yeah, authority comes after objectivity and that's at any level. We're often told, you know, autistic people, you know, we don't um, uh, respect uh, authority, but actually, no, it's not. We do respect authority, um, you know, and uh, it's a bit like, you know, if, if you had lipstick on your teeth, your best friend's gonna kind of knock you and go, you know, rub the lipstick off your teeth. And, uh, and we are that type of person, that, that really um, honest, a critical friend. <laughs> basically and everywhere needs that next slide please so yeah how do we get that autistic talent through the door it starts probably from the advert from the advert that goes out for a vacancy that's where it starts um we need to make sure what would be lovely in a dream scenario is that every company had um a database which obviously the autistic person would have to very willingly want to sign up to so the minute there's a vacancy in that company there's an email sent out to the autistic people that are, are keen to join um, and with an inaccessible email so it's in bullet points it tells you the how the what the why the when the who photos of who the people they might meet um, should they get through to interview stage a photo and a small bio about the person that they can call or text or email that could support them through the application process um, applying for a job and probably why I'm still self-employed applying for a job is incredibly tricky because you have to really know what the what the interview panel are looking for and it could be particularly if something's your special interest that you've done two three hundred jobs around this special interest but do you 
do you send in literally, um, you know, a, a list of everything you've ever done? Or how do you know which bits it have the context which is important for this particular role, which are the best ones? And actually that takes a lot of support. Um, and I've been trying to help people when they're accessing public appointments, be at the home office and, and such, to, to kind of say, well, you know, all of this is great, but this is what really shows what they're looking for. And, um, you know, and I preach that, but I can't do it for myself. I can stand up for other people and help them, but I'm not very good at doing it myself. So I, I, I have support from a, from a friend who isn't actually autistic that tells me this is the most important thing these people need to know. Otherwise, we could send in a CV, which is kind of 60 pages long or one sentence long, because we just don't know what to tweak out that's important for that particular role. So yeah, help with the application, um, guaranteed interview scheme. It's important that, that people tick the box um, if they feel comfortable to disclose the fact they're autistic um, to begin with. So, um, you know, if, if you meet the essential criteria, you, you should, um, and I say should, of course not always, but you should be able to be invited to interview because there can be that kind of unconscious bias of, of if, if the role you're going through isn't anything to do with autism and the people on that panel don't know much about autism, they may think of something quite stereotypical. It's often Rain Man um, and, and things like this. So um, they might not think this person would be right for the role. Sometimes people need to meet you um, and, and sometimes a form, a form doesn't convey that. So it's really guaranteed interview scheme is really important because if people can meet you, and, um, and, and see what you've got to offer. Sometimes that doesn't always jump out on paper first. So yeah, again, the explicit email communication is super important. Um, let's give an example. If somebody was to say to me on a Sunday, I'll see you next Wednesday, I would turn up in about three days time because that's the next Wednesday. But often when people say things like that, they're saying, I will see you Wednesday week. So then you turn up either a week early or a week late for your interview. It doesn't look good. Um, so, so making sure that if, if anything's done on the telephone, particularly that's backed up in an email and it's really explicit with times and dates, even better photos of, of perhaps the room, thinking about um, the lighting, the sensory issues as well, those sort of things and having that discussion beforehand. Um, and yeah, Next slide, please. So we hear a lot about diversity and inclusion, and that's incredibly important. Diversity is super important, but it's, it's quite important for companies when they're onboarding autistic talent to, to think, well, actually, it's not just a diversity issue. Um, although we use the word neurodiversity or neurodivergent a lot, um, we have to think actually about reasonable accommodations. We need to think about disability. Disability is a little bit different to diversity, although it can come under that umbrella, because um, diversity is making sure that everyone has, you know, the same chance to do something. Disability is more about equity, isn't it? So we can see here with this, this image that there's a, if we go for equality, everybody's got the same size box to stand on to watch this game, but actually someone's a lot shorter or someone's a lot taller. Um, equity, sometimes that does mean giving more, giving more help. Um, and that's that sometimes, my worry is that sometimes that gets lost in diversity discussions. We think a lot, of, rightly so, we think a lot about gender, we think a lot about race. Um, but are we really thinking enough about disability and what that means when it comes to employment? Next slide, please. Oh, and that is the end of my slide and I finished early. Um, yeah, there's a lot, a lot more to consider. We, um, we do need to make sure that, I mean, e even now, we've had very recently and we had Elon Musk coming out as a, as a Spurgers um, on live TV, which is great. But also this tends to be two, um, two kind of stereotypes um, when we think about autistic people. We're either going to be um, maths geniuses that are about to win a Nobel Peace Prize for something scientific, and I'll disclose to you now, I do not have a maths GCSE, um, or, you know, we're somebody that's going to need so much help, it's not really, it's going to be too much hard work, I think a lot of people think. So we need to make sure that there's a lot more role models, particularly in 
a company um, in an organization and that would attract autistic talent in it would also make sure that people are aware that autism isn't just boys and men and it isn't just super geniuses some of us are just trying to raise our family <laughs> um, and some of us are just trying to work and we do have good ideas um, but we also do do need quite a lot of support there as well it's it can be a huge challenge I think one of the best examples of really welcoming autistic people into into a workplace is having autistic people on the interview panel having autistic people um, that work in a company as part of be it an advertising campaign having role models so people think actually that's a company i know i could work for because i they see their face fits if that makes sense that's really important um, we wouldn't nowadays have uh, have a panel which is completely men um, and, and I think it needs to be the same when it comes to any diversity and particularly disability. Um, incredibly important because we need to know, feel, feel that we're able to go in. We have something called disability confident, which is often about having a company or an organisation feel confident about employing disabled people. But actually that works both ways. We need to make sure that actually people with disabilities are autistic people also feel confident enough to apply in the first place because they know it's not going to be this huge fight just to be able to work so i hope i hope that's helped and i'm i'm, I'm up for any questions and sorry my powerpoint was too short i was too long last time <laughs> so now i've done it too short no, not at all it's always better to be slightly under time than slightly over time so don't be worried about it. we're absolutely delighted uh, with your contribution carly so thank you so much for that and i'm sure there'll be lots of questions at the end um, that we'll be able to ask you but that was really helpful really practical strategies that I think many people will be able to to take away with them today so really Thanks. appreciate your your input there and um, so up next we have our second speaker today who is Coleman O'Connell so Coleman is an autistic self-advocate from Galway who works as a claims processor with Alliance a role he obtained with the support of the AHEAD WAM program the WAM is the willing able mentoring program He's completed a bachelor's degree in history, sociology and political science in NUI Galway before moving on to do two masters, one in history and another in archive and record management. Coleman will share his personal experience of going through the onboarding process as an autistic employee, how he adjusted to his new role within Alliance, how AHEAD supports him at work through the WAM programme and what advice he would give to employers who are looking to support autistic employees starting out a new job within your organization so coleman thank you so much for coming along today and for joining us and um, so it's over to you now and we're really looking forward to hearing from you uh, thank you very much fiona and uh thank you uh thank you carly for your your speech it was very enjoyable uh first of all i want to say uh, thank you all for coming because this is a, a great example of the fact that a lot that there's a lot more supports out there for people with ASD. I mean, the fact is that you're here shows that you have an interest in recruiting, which I think is an important, an important first step. So one area, uh, one thing I can tell you is when I first graduated from college, I thought things would be easier, you know, that, you know, I could get a job, uh, you know, but the problem is there's not as much demand for a history, a, a person who graduated from hist studying history. So, you know, at first I found it difficult and, you know, I tried another MA just to get another, you know, just to improve my qualification, but in the end it didn't suit me. But thanks to WAM, uh, they were an important middleman. In many ways, uh, WAM provided me with support and connected me with Allion. So the fact is, a lot of people don't realize this, but when you go into work, I mean, you already know, uh, you know, most places want experience. So this, the thing is, though, that's the conundrum. So when you just graduated, you don't have, you know, you don't have two years of a job behind you. So the fact is that WAM gives a lot of people like myself the opportunity to get into work, particularly, uh, you know, giving us our first step into the work world, you know, giving us a chance. And the fact is, uh, Allianz has been very supportive. So First off, uh, when I first uh, started in the company, when I first started in the company, they uh, gave me two weeks. So uh, when I first started in the company, they gave me two weeks of uh, personal training. So thanks to WAM informing them about my about my ASD, 
they were able to you know adapt and prepare so during the two weeks even though this was during covid they trained me to uh you know every trained me through the claims process with trained me through the claims process uh you know through everything you know how to use the data how to use the records and how to organize the data so that was an important step so So one important thing uh, besides that, one important thing I appreciated from Allianz is the fact that they gave me a heads up about what kind of questions they'd ask for during the interview. And that's an important area. I mean, you see, as uh, Carly said previously, we like to prepare for everything. So, you know, for this situation, uh, for interviews, you know, when we're given a heads up within a few days, we like to practice and we like to prepare for our interviews. So from my experience, uh, I spent two weeks preparing for the interview and, you know, thanks to WAM, you know, setting up, uh, thanks for WAM having workshops and lectures on how to uh, prepare for interviews, but also due to, uh, my, due to my family, you know, strong family and uh, friends, you know, helping me. So one thing to realize from my experience, I think it's important to sometimes take more initiative. Like you can't just always rely on like WAM's brilliant, but sometimes you have to put in your own personal time to prepare for interviews. So I'm happy I did that. And during the interview, it was a, an important experience. The, like Carly said, the, the interviews are so important because a lot of the time uh, it's difficult to make a first impression. And thanks to the fact that they, the interviewers were aware of my ASD, they were polite and they, uh, and they understood and let me answer my questions answer my, their questions. And uh, another thing that you, uh, during my uh, time in uh, Allianz, a great, a great thing that uh, I noticed was that I was able to adapt. So one of the big stereotypes of ASD is that we're unwilling to adapt. But as you can tell from my accent, I had to, I actually had to move abroad to, uh, you know, to get the supports, uh, get the supports I needed to, you know, be able to mask. So the fact I am able to keep contact was because I had to adapt to a new country and I had to learn. So, uh, you know, I got ahead of my, uh, I was able to learn like stuff like eye contact and how to mask my ASD. So when I came back to Ireland, I then had to adapt again to a new system. So the fact is uh, with COVID, although it's been difficult and as the Chinese proverb says, we're living in interesting times. The fact is, it has shown that many people are able to adapt. So an alliance has been terrific. The fact is, even though the situation is difficult, we still have coffee meetings. I, I still keep in contact with my manager and my mentor and it's fantastic. I mean, the fact is we still have coffee mornings where we discuss problems. We also, uh, you know, we also do out after work activities such as pub quizzes and which are great, like, uh, like you probably already know, uh, we love information. So if any, you know, when it, especially when it comes to, for myself, especially when it comes to film facts. So one thing uh, also uh, I, I appreciate from Allianz and what's very important is you need to be, uh, you know, you shouldn't sugarcoat things. So you see, from my experience, I rather, if I know I'm doing a good job, I'm happy with that. But if, if, I, if I'm told I'm not doing a good job, I learn and I improve. So sometimes you shouldn't sugarcoat your employees. Like some, like from my own experience, it's better to be honest with them. You don't have to be blunt, but you should you know, just be able to talk to them about how they can improve or what they're doing well at. Because you know, we enjoy, we appreciate that because it allows us to learn and to improve. And uh, one th also, I want to, again, like I said, the fact is uh, from Allianz and from WAM, what I really appreciate from this, uh, this lecture is the fact that as HR managers, you are willing to learn. And that is always the first step in, you know, in uh, you know, improving society. The fact is that I'm, I really do appreciate being able to talk to you here because it is important, the fact that you know, 10 years ago, I had to immigrate, you know, when I was four years old, I had to immigrate to America just to get my supports. But then when I came home 11 years, 10 years later, 11 years ago, 
to Ireland, I was amazed at how much things have improved. I mean, there's still a way to go. And the fact is, I think the fact that you're making this first step I think the fact that you're willing to take the first step in uh, trying to you know, recruit people such as myself, I think that's a great change and it, show, it makes you wonder what will happen five years from now. Also, uh, also another thing uh, I would have to say is, uh, you know, people, like uh, Carly said, a lot of people are nervous about whether to tell people they have ASD. And it's understandable because, you know, if like myself, you're able to mirror it, it's, you know, it's, you have an advantage compared to others. But the fact is, I think it's necessary to inform your employer because you need to be honest with them because you shouldn't, uh, you know, because once employers know, they have, they are, they're more willing to, uh, adapt, they're more willing to prepare for your interviews. So in my opinion, it's better to be honest because you shouldn't be ashamed of your ASD. I mean, an ASD is part of you. And frankly, a world needs a neurodiverse society. And as we see with, uh, as Carly said, Elon Musk, or as we see with, uh, with the with modern research, the fact is a lot of people are, have different, neuro, are neurodiverse and we need to, and we need to, you know, make a world more friendly to that. So yes, I do believe uh, you should be honest with your employer. And yes, to be honest, you will face stereotypes. I mean, I applied for, you know, when I applied for multiple jobs, you know, no matter how much qualifications I had, I still had people, once they, people heard you have ASD, they, uh, you know, they always assumed, you know, it's, so sometimes you have to be prepared for that. But that's why it's better to deal with the problem head on by telling your employers or people who are you're hiring, who are willing to hire you this, they're prepared for you and you, uh, you, know, you don't have to you know, make excuses. You can, they either will be willing to interview you or they show their true colors. So, uh, Anyways, uh, one thing I have to say, and like Carly said, is it's a, assumptions that are the problem. So the fact I'm able to, like I said previously, the fact I can keep eye contact, that took years of study. So, you know, most people assume that, most people assume that, uh, you know, ASD, that we can't keep eye contact or that, uh, and the, the thing is though, where this proves the fact that I'm able to keep eye contact, that proves that supports at a young age that you can be able to, to, to mirror the fact, which is important. So, uh, like I said, things have improved greatly since I came here. I had immigrated, but the fact is, there's still not enough supports. I mean, I was lucky the fact that uh, I went to a great school system in uh, Madison, Wisconsin, which at the time it was ahead of the research with ASD. But like Carly said, there's still a lot of supports. It specifically supports for girls who, uh, you know, a lot of our uh, a lot of our supports are still male centric. So the fact is, even with uh, ASD supports, there is some sexism that I would have an advantage over a, a, a girl, a woman who would have the same condition as me. So that's something to be aware of. Uh, that there, even with uh, ASD, there there's always other forms of discrimination to be aware of. Uh, also, from my, I have to say, Ali, WAM has been terrific. I mean, the fact is, they have provided me with supports. Uh, you know, for example, the training seminars and CV CV improvements. Uh, as Carly said previously, it's good to have a friend or support there to help you with your CVs, or you know, just to help you because sometimes you need an outside perspective. So, you know, sometimes uh, let's say uh, authors need editors. So, some of the greatest authors no matter how great their piece was, they always needed somebody to review it and to get, you know, to give you an honest opinion. And that's what it's like for people with ASD. We need support, like myself, we need support to, uh, you know, just to be honest with us, you know, to tell us where we can improve and how others perceive our views. So that's an important thing, as I said previously, that not only uh, should you rely on groups such as WAM and As I Am for supports, but strong family and friends are always a valuable resource as, uh, 
as uh, I can assure you. I mean, I, I come, my mother came from a family of 12, so you can imagine I have good, uh, I have good supports there. <laughs> so anyways, uh, first of all, as I said already multiple times, apologies. I wanna thank you all for coming and the fact that you're here, I really do think it's showing an improved Ireland and thank you so, again, thank you for letting me speak for the past 15 minutes, thank you. No, thank you, Coleman. That was fantastic. It was really interesting to hear about your own experiences, what worked for you and the advice uh, that you would give or you would recommend uh, as a result of that. So, so thank you for your contribution. That was absolutely fantastic. So have a few questions have come in uh, for our speakers today. So the first one, Carly, uh, is for you, if that's all right. Um, so hi, thank you for a great session. I had a question about Carly's suggestion for having role models in the company to encourage applications. Oh, sorry, pop up there. Uh, what tips or suggestions do you have for a company to encourage potential role models who may have worked with us for some time to speak up if they have masked their differences or not opened up about their needs before? Oh, that's a very good question. And you know, when it comes to the data around how um, how many disabled people um, or diverse people work in a company, actually, that can be quite tricky if it's something that's just been decided to be done, but actually somebody's worked there for 10, 15 years already. It, that's that's the tricky part. Um, and in a way, it's, it's kind of coming out, isn't it? Coming out to your colleagues and you think, am I still going to get that pay rise or am I going to get promoted if I tell them this or are they going to 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 you know some sadly sometimes think less um I think it's a top to bottom issue so it needs to come from the top of the top of the company um obviously not getting a meeting going right who's autistic put your hand up <laughs> you know um, and particularly if someone's older they might not have ever got their diagnosis because we know that's you know in more recent decades there's more awareness um it's a tricky one it is something that people are going to have to um decide for themselves to come forward it would be i guess just having more about even if it's posters um say it's a uh, an office posters a, a bit about neurodiversity uh, really upbeat posters of course um or or just having discussions or even very discreetly doing something like this or getting hold of as i am to say you know can you come and do um a talk about neurodiversity or, or about autism for for our for our company um and you might find that people then willingly think ah i'm safe here but it's really important to feel safe I can remember going into um, into one particular organisation and department, and uh, and I've always been very out and proud autistic because I want to. I don't want my daughters to have to jump that hurdle, and, and other um, and other young people to have to jump that hurdle. So I uh, I'm always out and proud about it. And then um, someone took me to one side and said, you know, you should get a full time job here. We're kind of whispering, you should get a full time job here because I'm autistic and they've been brilliant. I was like, so why are we whispering? <laughs> you know. <laughs> um so yeah probably hasn't forgiven me for that but uh but yeah we have to just kind of have that culture of it's not something we have to say behind unless you know unless they're very anxious it's not something that has to be said behind a closed door um or a one someone you know we don't need to whisper about it it's fine and it's just kind of having that that company culture um and you know if if anybody unfortunately for for, for children um, a teen secondary school age I, I know you know autism is sometimes used as a, as a derogatory term so you know it's being really hot on people that that might say ableist words as well as I've seen you know that isn't part of our culture and um, we don't really talk like that here in the same way we would use homophobic culture we wouldn't use racist culture and uh, about about managers being really hot on that and just going that's that's not acceptable here um, and making autistic people, people feel safe and then and then they'll probably start to disclose a bit more but it's it's um it's not an overnight solution i'm afraid <laughs> no i totally agree with you there about the top down it really has to be there has to be a whole of culture change within an organization before autistic people are going to feel comfortable disclosing so it, it's hard to get somebody to, to disclose after facing so many hurdles and so much discrimination in the past um without there being a very safe 
workplace or environment they feel they can be supported whenever they do disclose. Uh, so I totally agree with, with everything that you said there, Carly. Uh, and hopefully that uh, answered your question. Uh, Coleman, I have a question for you, if that's okay. So do you think oh, that... Yes. <laughs> do you think that working remotely or working from home will have an impact for autistic people, either positive or negative? Well, it really depends on the person. So, for example, at the moment, uh, while I would uh, enjoy to be in the office like a few days a week, the fact is, you know, even when COVID, uh, you know, when COVID uh, isn't the same problem as it is at the moment, we're still going to have people, you know, you're only going to work a few days in the office, a few days at home. And it just depends on what you do at that time. So, you know, some people, you know, when I first started work, I, you know, I was just being lethargic. I was just like, uh, you know, having my lunch and just take it easy. But sometimes you just have to drive yourself. So one thing I would recommend is, you know, do something productive in that hour besides just have lunch. So what I do is I have a, a lovely park near me, St. Anne's, uh, is an RT the other day, uh, if you saw it. Uh, but what I do is I try, I drive myself to do a run. So, you know, at lunch, I try to do a 30 minute 5k run, you know, for half my uh, lunch, you know, I try to get that done, you know, just to clear my head, but also just to, you know, just to improve my endorphins, to improve, uh, you know, just make me feel better. So, you know, so one thing I can say, uh, one advice I'd have, uh, it's not easy. We all know it's not easy with this COVID. I mean, you're, you're stuck in your house, it's stressful and, you know, it depends on where you're living, but it's about trying to, you know, you know, self-development, try to do something productive in that time that, you know, makes you feel good, but also, you know, but also can be a great thing to achieve. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. And I actually have one more question for you, if that's OK, so that I'm not okay. jumping back to Carly, and then jumping back to you in the interest of consistency. No, uh, there's, no, a there's a question that came in that I think uh, perhaps you might be able to answer. Uh, about social work relationships. So is that something you find to be easy or is it challenging? Well, with COVID, it hasn't been as easy. So, you know, when you're in the office, I always find, I always enjoy coffee more, you know, in the morning when we're all having our coffee, because at that time, it's a great way to start conversation. So me, I, I love politics. So, you know, I'd be reading the paper. So, you know, but to be honest, in the mornings, most people uh, wouldn't want to talk about uh, politics. So, you know, Sometimes uh, what I notice is you sometimes have to, you know, adapt to people. So, you know, I try to read up a bit on sports or on, a, you know, what was on TV the other night. So, you know, sometimes you have to make the first step in like what people would be interested in. You know, you can't just. The thing about ASD, sometimes you get sometimes obsessed with, you know, your own hobby. And that's something difficult. You need to you need to be able to adapt to other people. So. That's one thing that uh, I. I miss, you know, the coffee mornings, but like I said, uh, you know, it's, you know, it's great at the moment that we still have support such as web chats and stuff. And one great thing is with Allianz, we have coffee, we still have coffee mornings where not only do we deal with my, with uh, your own manager, you deal with actually uh, the head of the company and, you know, it depends on how you do deal with that. So, you know, for example, you can either just listen to it and just be quiet, or you can take advantage of it and, ask you'll be able to ask an actual question of your your boss for a major company so like I said it just depends on who you are and how you adapt to these situations yeah I, I totally agree I imagine for many people it's it's made the working environment a lot more accessible but perhaps for for other autistic people who do enjoy the engagement and do enjoy being able to to interact you know it's it's probably the change hasn't been the easiest thing to manage either if you're used to being in the office all the time and then overnight uh, everybody is working remotely but it's of course going to be totally different for everybody what their experience is uh, but yeah that's brilliant thank you so much Coleman uh, I have a question for Carly again if that's okay um so let me see here what do you feel would support an autistic employee at the beginning of coming into a new job the first day the first week the first month whenever they start work lots of um lots of information in advance but delivered in a really clear way which isn't uh, that's a bit of a skill actually so obviously you've got the practicalities um it might be nice there's something about workplaces so you have um you have the rules 
and you have the job description, but nobody tells you about the office culture. Who brings in the cakes when it's someone's birthday? Are we expected to put a fiver in the pot towards flowers? Who do, you know, who takes the, if there's a bin to be taken, who does? And, and that kind of office culture is not on any job description, um, but you're expected to know it. Um, and that that can be quite tricky. So obviously you've got the, the 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 standard professional formal stuff, such as this is when you're expected to arrive. This is what your job description is. This is you know uh, the structure of your role, who's who you report to or who reports to you. But no one tells you the the stuff about who washes up the coffee cups. And it would just be nice. <laughs> On that first day to have someone someone lovely like you fiona to go this is you know just to fill them in on the uh not gossiping because we're not really into gossip but just to say this is the um this is the 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 subtext because we're not going to get that and i tell you what you can get your job wrong but if you don't wash up your coffee cup for a week or you you, you forget to bring in donuts or whatever it is on who is so and so day then you then you become a bit alienated in the workplace. So yeah, the subtext, someone to go through the stuff you're supposed to do and the stuff you're supposed to know and the stuff you're supposed to know, but no one ever tells you, which other people tend to just pick up. But <laughs> for me anyway. <laughs> yeah, totally, totally agree. And uh, I think I'm blue in the face sometimes saying that it's all the in-between bits, all the gray areas, the office politics, who buys the tea bags, Yes. It, sounds, it sounds ridiculous, but it's the things that aren't laid out in black and white for the autistic person. And everybody else has this amazing sense of social imagination where they can pick up the in-between pieces. But for autistic people, making those a rule and putting it out there in black and white can be so helpful. And it's often those in-between bits that lead autistic people to not stay in a job because they're the most confusing. It's nothing to do with the ability to do the job. Um, so that's great advice, Carly. <laughs> yeah, really good. Thank you. Uh, there's one other question for you, actually, here, if that's OK. What advice would you give to employers on how to prepare other employees in the department in terms of when we're rec recruiting an autistic person? What and how do we help other members of the team? Uh, how do we support them to work with the autistic person as well? Well, yeah, I say it would, it would definitely be um, done before the autistic person arrives. So can you imagine arriving on your first day at work and then there's a training session all about your condition? <laughs> that would be a bit awkward, wouldn't it? Um, and, and hopefully it's not the first autistic person that, that, that the company's seen. But let's say it is. Um, I would say that they probably got hold of, as I am, um, asked for a bit of training or a webinar. Um, and, and, and even, I mean, this is recorded perhaps something like this to, um, to, to share with staff. Were you a bit of a lunch and learn? I remember doing lunch and learns in the office. So it's basically working on your lunch break, <laughs> but it's um, training. See, that's another subtext. What's a lunch and learn? You're working on your lunch break, but you get to eat at the same time. Um, yeah, something like that, just, just to go over it. And, um, and it's, it's the, the, the thing is often, when we talk about an autistic person joining a, a whatever job it is or whatever role we and because it's done out of care and empathy i'm sure but we often go straight to talking about um this autistic person and and how other people can can help um and 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 not be unhelpful um but actually any person you get into an office you might have someone that's just really grumpy <laughs> there's no training for that really grumpy person or there's no training for the person that you know is um, constantly singing in the corner that sort of thing as well so it does go both ways but yes I think um, I, um and also we tend to sometimes concentrate just on the fact they're autistic um and, and not actually that they're really good at their job um and it's it's often the case that, that that's an issue as well from an autistic perspective it's sometimes um, you sometimes think, oh, am I here to tick a HR tick box? Got any disabled people? Oh, brilliant, you know. <laughs> um, so, yeah, just uh, maybe something, a webinar or some training again, like I said before, but obviously before the autistic person joins up. And even if you haven't got any autistic people um, that you know of um, joining for a while, why wait? 
why wait because then it doesn't kind of single an employee out it's just something that the, the company's been doing um anyway which would attract the talent as well yeah absolutely and it's funny you say that because just last week uh, as i am launched uh lunch and learn those exact words <laughs> really? um I, I, <laughs> sorry <seriously? laughs> no, it's hilarious yeah i know um it's once a week um different topic every week so this week was uh, introduction to autism but we'll be covering um from a very basic perspective all the different areas of autism autism anxiety sensory processing so they're suitable for people who have never come across autism or autistic people that they're aware of obviously they have uh, but they might not be aware of or they might not know um how to support a person so it's a great first step in getting that knowledge so you can find out everything i said about it being actually working on your lunch break it's not <laughs> They are good. You do learn a lot. It's after it's part of your work day. You can take your lunch <laughs> off. Um, but yeah, you can find out all about that on the As I Am events page. Uh, so it's every week, and uh, the more the merrier. And that just means that there's more people who'll be in your workplace, whether there's autistic people there already or not, uh, or whether there's about to be an autistic person on your team. It's just a great way of building your knowledge of how you can support. Um, your, your colleagues. I mean, autistic friendly measures or people friendly measures. So we can never get too much knowledge uh, that that's uh, something that's important to mention. Um, Coleman, I have a question for you, and I think that will be our last question of today then. So it says, thank you for the insightful perspectives in relation to providing resources for interviews, for example, questions that might be asked or an interview setup. Is it best, do you feel, to provide these upfront in an email to all candidates, or would the option be for candidates to request an autism-friendly interview resource? What do you feel might be the best approach? To be honest, uh, from my own experience that, look, I understand the perspective, like you think, why should we send this to everyone? Uh, the fact is we only have to send to a few employees, but the fact is, you know, look, I know you may think that's helpful, but sometimes you're only like cherry picking them. So, you know, makes them feel like, you know, makes them feel like they're, you know, they're like no one else. And look, in my opinion, it's, you're like, it's a bit difficult, like, you know, making somebody a uh, single thing, single them out. Like, so, you know, it makes them feel like, did you only hire me because of this, because I had an advantage over everyone else. And, you know, you have to be aware of that sometimes because people will say that to you you know, that the only reason you got a job was, like you said, just to make the company look good. So I think maybe a blanket giving people a heads up for interviews not only would be helpful to people who don't have ASD, because it's always good to prepare anyways, but I also think it's necessary to, you know, make sure you're there's no excuses. People don't have any excuse to judge why you got the job, but they appreciate you got the job because you're qualified and that even if you have something like ASD, you're still are the most qualified for the position. So yes, I, I do think you should give a blank, blanket it out to all people who are being recruited for the job. Thank you. I totally agree. I think if you want to be providing a truly accessible and inclusive interview process, it's important that everybody is receiving the same support and same materials. And you don't have to be autistic to need to prepare a little bit. You don't have to be autistic to need to know what to expect. I mean, these are just people friendly measures and the more accessible we make the interview process, the more comfortable the person is going to be in the interview, which means you'll get a better reflection of their ability to do the job rather than their ability to answer tricky questions on the spot. I don't think that's a true reflection of a person's ability to do a job. So there's there's no downside to providing a person with, you know, a, a visual guide. Uh, pictures of who's going to be on the interview panel, a list of questions or areas of questions that could potentially be asked. I mean, that's not allowing anybody to cheat. It's actually just making sure the person can be the best version of themselves whenever they come to the interview. Um, so I, I totally agree, Coleman. I think for everybody is the best option. And also it's it's that's that's being equitable. That's giving everybody um, the, the opportunity to have the accommodations that they might need. Some people might not need it, some people do, but at least that way they're getting the opportunity. So 
I think that is everything for today, guys. I really enjoyed that. I think that was an excellent combination, uh, both with the advice that you were providing us, Carly, the recommendations, and also the personal experience that you brought to it through Ahead and through Wam Coleman and just your own experiences within Alliance. Uh, so we really are thankful and appreciative for both of you taking the time today to, to come and speak to us. And we really hope that everybody who, who tuned in today got some valuable information that they can take away with them. Of course, this webinar is being recorded. So if some of your colleagues or a manager or an employee wasn't able to come along today, just send them on the webinar. It should be on our page in the next few days and uh, hopefully it'll be helpful for them as well. So that is all from us today, guys. Thank you so much. And we will be posting up hopefully in the next week or so, the date of our next masterclass. And we hope to see you there. Thanks everyone.